my shoes and out the door Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great Now I'm gonna shine, life is good I'm doing fine, and gonna do it right Hey everybody, welcome back to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast I'm your co-host, Dr. Mike Akinfor Today with me, I have Pedram Sojai Pedram, how hey, are you? Great, good to be here Awesome uh, let me just read Pedram's bio. Pedram's a man with many titles. He's the founder of Well.org, the editor of Be More! Exclamation Point magazine, and the author of Rise and Shine. That's out of process in 2011. He's the producer and director of the movies Vitality and Origins. He's the host of the Health Bridge and Urban Monk podcast, which are commonly top of the charts in iTunes. Pedram is starring in two TV shows coming in 2016 and has just published his next book called The Urban Monk. His next movie is in pre-production and is featuring some heavy hitters that are changing the world. Pedram is considered one of the most influential people in health and green media today. How are you, my doing friend? Great. I am doing great. All things considered, that... we had a sick baby at home last night, and anyone who could relate, it's like, oh, well, I don't get to sleep. <laughs> you know, you just you got to roll with the punches and understand that that's what life is, right? Like sometimes life will serve you a sick child, and you're gonna stay up with them, and you still gotta have gas in the tank to to run your day the next day. Absolutely, and congratulations. I know you recently had a yeah, baby. thank you. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And as such, I am sure we will talk about sleep in <laughs> Chapter 4 of your book, uh, appropriately enough. <laughs> so I would like to go through. There are 10 chapters. I love the format. Um, I love some of the layout of how you have urban monk wisdom. You have Eastern philosophy. And then you have uh, modern hacks. And the way that's laid out is just brilliant on, on my end. I loved well, thank it. Thank you. I happen, to, I happen to digest it all yesterday in our, while we sat in our three feet of snow here <laughs> in the East Coast. So chapter one talks about stress. And the one thing that you said in the very beginning is work to develop the prefrontal cortex. Um, power up your third eye. Can you talk about that a yeah. little bit? So there's very specifically uh, parts of the brain that we've identified that just so happen to coincide with what these ancients have been talking the whole time about, you know, where the third eye is. That This part of the brain is responsible for suppressing the impulses and some of the, the, the noise that comes up from the amygdala, which is, you know, fight, fight, stress, you know, fear, overwhelm. And so this executive part of the brain basically is uh, impulse uh, suppression and uh, moral reasoning and higher cognitive function. And there's studies out of Harvard, there's studies everywhere now showing that a little bit of meditation can increase the density of the neurons in this part of the brain, which not only helps you be like, okay, stop freaking out. You're just going to stand up there and talk in front of your colleagues. It also keeps you from saying no to the pumpkin pie or the cheesecake. It, it keeps you from snapping at your kid when, you know, times aren't good and you came home and you're exhausted and you got bills to pay. It's the part of your brain that helps you step in and do the right thing. And that's the part of our brain that we run away from with stress. And so there's, you know, really kind of serious biochemistry that happens that pulls the blood out of that part of the brain when our cortisol goes up. But there are practices, techniques, and all sorts of good stuff that you can do every day to counteract and offset that so you can be living back up in the right part of the brain where, you know, from that perch, you can make better decisions and then your life goes better. So to me, it's like vindication from, you know, all these kind of spiritual texts that told us about this area. And now it's like we totally get why this area is so important neurologically. Absolutely. And one of the things that you said would be a good practice is Qigong practice is tree pose. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So there's a couple poses that are so easy to do, right? Because, I mean, most of us live in environments where we got to just, uh, you know, maybe not do a headstand in front of our colleagues. And so, you know, the tree pose, and you could even go straight to Wu Chi pose, where it just looks like you're standing around. 
is so easy because all you need is your body standing there, right? And so you line up, you line up your spine, you line up your, your crown so that, you know, your spine is straight. And then you just slowly breathe in and out of your lower abdomen while letting yourself sink so that your quads and your glutes are doing a little bit of work. You're generating some heat, you're building some power, and you're dropping and anchoring your breath down to your lower abdomen. And that, man, it makes a difference. And it's not like, you know, everyone thinks that doing all this stuff requires shaving your head and moving up into the mountains. And, you know, you know, I can't do yoga unless it's an hour and a half. And that's all nonsense, right? If I could just take a five-minute breather and stretch out and do some qigong and drop into my tree pose and just feel better, Maybe I could get that in a couple times a day. That's way better than hoping to get an hour and a half yoga, which hardly ever happens because life keeps happening. 100%. 100% true. And we talk to our our practice members and really uh, with our online community about those exact things. One of the things you also talk about is modern hacks. And the one thing you talk about is a, a morning visualization. What, what morning rituals do you do, including this um, morning visualization? Well, a lot of people start their day um, letting the outside universe drive. And so what that means mm -hmm. is, you know, I may or may not have goals for my day. And some people don't even know. They just get up and, like, kind of figure, you know, figure out where they're supposed to be next. But, you know, a lot of people would be like, okay, I got to get this book done, this chapter done, this email done, whatever. And then they open up their email and then start dealing with everyone else's demands of them. And next thing you know, you look up and you're just kind of like tumbling around in the whitewater of, of, you know, life. And, you know, it's 4.30, everyone's starting to leave the office and you still haven't gotten done the thing that you need done. Sorry about that. And, and, right. and you're not getting done the things that you need done in life. And that becomes... Uh, kind of this big issue with kind of like your your core promises to yourself. So what I do is I get up, think about what needs to get done that day, and basically between, you know, and times have shifted a little bit because I got little kids at home, but, you know, basically between 8 and 11 a.m., I don't really check emails. I don't, you know, call my buddies and be like, hey, how was that thing last night, you know? I just basically get it done, Right. And get done the most yep. important thing that I needed done that day. And then I'll check some emails. Then I'll, you know, take a couple of work calls or whatever. And I, and I chunk out my week very kind of specifically where I can only, you know, my appointments only fall on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Friday is CEO day. So I can only work on the business and not in the business. And then, you know, yep. it's just I, I do that because if not, every day is just like crazy. Right. And, you know, you can't get anything done that way. And that's exactly what you talk about in Chapter 2, The Art of Mastering Time. And you talk about a, a, a brilliant, I've never heard it before, but time compression syndrome and FOMO and JOMO. Could you expound upon those for sure. me? Sure. So time compression syndrome is a, a term I coined, actually, because I just, I realized that a lot of the stress, you know, and we're talking about like, you know, thousands of patients over the years, right? So it's not, you know, there's some people yep. that are theorists and other ones like us who've been on the front lines actually helping people um, <laughs> every day of our lives in clinics. So, you know, I, I'm much more likely to listen to, a, a, you know, an able physician than I am to someone who's just, you know, making stuff up. Because uh, if it doesn't work, your patients don't come back. Um, so the time compression syndrome is really when we layer on too many items on a timeline than is comfortable to execute. And so what that means is I already got like a big project today and then someone's like, hey, can you send this quick email for me? And you say yes. You've now compressed two mm -hmm. items on that timeline. Then someone else says, hey, you want to go to lunch? And it's a little farther. You were hoping to stay in and catch up on work, but you say yes. And so now all of a sudden you're at lunch, but you're not at lunch because you're living in this compressed time where you have these other things that you need to get done in this allotted amount of time. And so what that translates into is stress. And that stress mm -hmm. is where we're all walking around. Just we can't be present because we're always dealing with things that we have committed to that we haven't quite gotten be able to get to because we're really terrible at saying no to things in time 
Therefore, we collapse um, the time into this like craziness where it's just completely compressed and filled with items that we can't reasonably get done in the amount of time we have in a given day, given our commute, given our time for lunch, given our time to go to the bathroom, you know, just given reality, right? We, we are unrealistic with sure. what we can do. And so and a lot of people have this fear of missing out, the FOMO, which is like, you know, I got to check CNN again, you know, every half hour to make sure, you know, the world hasn't ended or, you know, what has ISIS done this week? And, you know, it's just you, you got to stay up on things. So that always takes time. And then, you know, the, the JOMO is interesting because now there's this whole kind of counter revolution to that where people are just, you know, there's this joy of missing out, which is like, you know what? I cut media for a week and my life actually got better. How much of this actually serves me? How much of this do I actually need to know? I mean, if there's a flash flood in my neighborhood, let me know. You know, but if like something happened in Africa that's like completely atrocious again this week, does that pull me away from the spreadsheet I'm working on again and again and again? Or can I kind of catch up on that at some other time in life? I'm not saying don't be informed, but I'm saying do you need to be as informed as you think you need to be every waking moment? Um, you know, we all live like we, we all live like people at a news desk now. It's just insane. Like you don't need that kind of information interrupting your day, you know, every single minute. A hundred percent true. You cannot escape the omnipotent media and the news. It's it's just not possible unless you completely detach from all social media, because it's even if you say, oh, I don't watch the news, it's still on your AOL. It's still on your Comcast. It's it's there. It's on media. It's on Facebook. It's everywhere. As soon as you look at that feed, you are you basically were standing there watching this river and then you jumped in and now you are tumbling down the white water of a Facebook feed, not knowing where you're going to end up. You might be looking at kittens, you might be looking at something political, but the one thing you're not looking at is what you said you wanted to get done that day. Then you go home feeling like a loser because you didn't finish what you wanted to do, and then you feel like your life just, I don't know, I go to work and you know I come home and I just feel like I never get anything done. It's like, okay, let's look at what you're actually doing at work. And so one of the things you did mention as the modern hack is a media fast, and I, I love that idea. And um, you also said that news poisons your mind, garbage in and garbage out. And you suggest, and I'm sure you had to do this uh, for, for the most part, a one month avoiding TV and social media. Yeah, it's not that hard. People are like, oh, my God, what, you know, what's going to happen? And the answer is, listen, if something crazy happens, your neighbor is going to tell you about it. Your friends are going to tell you about it, right? Um, and I got to say, I've taken people off of the media um, just this, this addiction to media and one month really is hard at first and then you realize hey your life is better and then you're like okay you know I'll find a better relationship with it you'll find that you have a lot more time you know your average person between TV and social media is, is, is spending about two hours a day and, and arguably three hours in some studies just doing this crap and you're like well I need the downtime well, you know what's better is 15 minutes of meditation crushes two hours of Facebook for downtime. Plus, your Absolutely. eyes aren't tired. Your brain is powered up. You feel good. You've done something for yourself. It's a win-win-win. Whereas this kind of like parking your body and giving your brain over to, you know, Fox News or, or whatever you're listening to, it's just a way to like build up anxiety and get yourself really, really stressed out unnecessarily. A hundred percent. In in chapter three, you you said some really neat stuff. Urban monk wisdom. It, you talk about chapter three is energy. You talk about know the shadow. I love that saying. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, everyone thinks that you know everything out there is altruistic. And look, there's there's there's. When I came down from the mountain, you know, I was a monk for four years and I'd spent a lot of time sitting on my butt contemplating life and, and you know, looking at desire and, and what that is and how that, you know, leads to suffering. And then I come, come down and I, and I realized I needed to make the world a better place through my films and my TV and all the things that I do to help, you know, wake people up. And, you know, you start studying Marketing 101 and Marketing 101 is all about finding people's desires and leveraging them. That means... Hey, I'm going to make you feel less pretty so I can sell you this mascara. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so that's just the core of like advertising and marketing. And then, you know, you could go way deeper and look at like, you know, arms manufacturers and cigarettes and big pharma and all these people that profit off of us not being well and not having balance in the world. And then, you, you know, it's just, it's the more I looked into it, the uglier it got. And I realized, you know what, this is a battle for the minds of men. And so if you want to be happy and be free in life, you cannot hand your, you know, open mind over to these, these elements out there that are all basically working to distract you so that you keep spending your valuable time, money, and energy on where they want it to go. No wonder we're all mm -hmm. tired and no wonder we don't have time. You know, we're giving them our life force and, and it's time to take that back. One of the Eastern practices you speak about is Qigong. Um, could you just touch on that a little bit for me? Yeah, so for people who might not know yeah, that. So the literal translation of Qigong is energy work. And so, you know, it's like you see people doing Tai Chi in the park. Tai Chi is actually uh, a martial art based on Qigong principles. And it's like slow and it's beautiful. So it looks kind of like Qigong. But Qigong is where you build up your internal energy through breath work and through like specific exercises. And, you know, this is the thing that, that just, you know, is amazing to me is everyone is talking about a lack of energy and qigong is very specifically a practice that helps resolve that and it's been around and it's been proven for you know 5000 years millions and millions of people have done qigong and they feel better they feel calmer and they have more energy but people in our culture will just borrow energy from tomorrow to get through today by drinking coffee and being like, ah, you know, I got energy in a can. And it just, it kills the adrenals. It wipes out the system. It screws up the hormones. And then we wonder why we're sick. So Qigong to me is really the missing ingredient. And that's like my secret sauce. I mean, I have a very busy life, two small children, books and movies and all the stuff that I do. And people are like, dude, I don't know how you do it. I'm like, well, look at the one thing that I consistently do every single day that you're not doing. It's Qigong. It totally yep. works. A hundred percent true. And we have in our in our practice in Bayonne, we have our acupuncturist is a Tai Chi master and also does Qigong as well. And the practice members that take advantage of that, I mean, their results are just off the charts. And it's just fuel for the soul, literally. You know, I'm glad you said that because over the years, I've had two kinds of patients. The ones that come in and say, Doc, fix me, and just flop down mm -hmm. on some sort of treatment table and expect you to do something for them. And the ones that, that, that are enlisted and have agency, yep. right? And the people I've identified that are there to get better are the same people that I will recommend, like, say, some lifestyle practices. I mean, my book is filled with lifestyle practices, but, you know, like, specifically, like, hey, I have this thing called Qigong. It's a little weird because we live in the West and we judge, but, you know, just do this practice a little bit and tell me how you feel. The ones that do it are always the ones that are consistently getting better, stepping out of their quote-unquote diagnosable illnesses and kind of going up, up, and away and living awesome lives. And the ones that don't do it are the ones that keep coming back saying, let me pay you money to keep trying to fix me, and those are the ones I fire because I don't want to be that kind of doctor, right? And so, you know, I got to say, it's, you know, expecting your doctor to fix you is one of the, the memes, the, the toxic memes that I think has really infected healthcare. The good doctor is a teacher, and the good doctor teaches you how to drink from infinity and restore your own vitality so that you can go back and live your life, right? You don't need to go into, it's like going into the body shop because you don't know how to drive and you keep crashing your car every week. Absolutely. Uh, let's get into something near and dear to both our hearts, sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, the NIH said, you said NIH said 30% of Americans have insomnia and 10% have daytime impairment. I would argue that that number's probably significantly 100%. higher. 100%. Um, and, and, and the reason is because the NIH is looking at, you know, very specific parameters. And I quoted it just to be like, look, this is what the NIH is saying. And the CDC yep. is saying 90% of people are, you know, 90% of illness comes from stress. But if you look yep. at it, what has been missing 
in our lives is this deceleration ritual, right? Like, you know, in the old days, sun goes down, you got to like huddle up with your clan because there's predators out there and it's dark and you don't, you know, you don't have flashlights. So you got a little torch, you got a little candlelight, you got a little bonfire, you hang around, you sing some songs, you dance, maybe you make some love, you go to bed. Now it's like we have these these lights coming out of these screens that are blue shifted that keep tricking our brain into thinking it's daytime that we got to get up and march, and it's just blasting our brains into like you know staying in a high speed, and then we go lie down in bed and we're like, hey, I don't understand why I can't just fall asleep. It's like, well, you didn't decelerate, you accelerated all day, and then your ritual of deceleration wasn't there, and then you're surprised that you're wound up. When you finally decide to stop, it's like slamming on the brakes. It's not it's not great for the car. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things I want to talk about the Eastern practice and and also the modern hacks. But one of the things that you wrote that I, I really think hit home for me is the half life of caffeine is five point seven hours. Explain that a little bit. So it takes five point seven hours for half of the caffeine to clear your system. Uh, you know through just biologically, like neurochemically. And so what that means is, uh, let's just say you have a cup of coffee at three o'clock because you're feeling that like lull and you still gotta get some stuff done. Let's just round it up and say six hours. So, you know, that stuff is still cranking. Half of it is still cranking by 9 p.m. You still have half that, say, 100 milligram dose in your system telling your cells and your brain and your adrenals and everything to keep marching. And then you want to go to bed by 10? <laughs> it's not yeah, happening. Good luck. It's not happening. Uh, talk about the ritual, Eastern practice of the ritual of the moon. That's a really fun one because I think, you know, a lot of us, and this is a practice um, that I think is, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring a metaphor in. Is sure. you know, your computer guy talks about this, and none of us do it, right? Which is, hey, what you should do is at the end of every day, close out all your windows and shut down your computer, and then restart it in the morning, just because you know you don't want to leave all the stuff in your RAM, and you don't want to leave all your windows open for weeks on end, and and you know it starts to become sluggish, it starts to hang up your computer, right? Uh, who Absolutely. The hell does that? But nobody. nobody, right? <laughs> but think about that in terms of your consciousness and your day how many open windows do you have going into bed that are still running how many programs are still running in your consciousness when you are trying to go to sleep so the ritual of the moon um, you know metaphorically is just kind of catching your breath slowing down decelerating and then just going and shutting down save and close all of the windows of all the crap you got going on in your head and if you need to like offload it onto a document to say to do tomorrow then do that right but just clear your to do's and clear your like you know he said she says and all the stuff from the day and just have a ceremony where you just kind of like wipe and clear and shut down for the evening and you'll find you know it might take a night or two it might take a week or two but all of a sudden your sleep quality gets to the point where like you wake up in the morning and you're just rocking right you just yep. you're, you've gotten what you needed out of sleep and a lot of people don't even remember what that's like a, a lot of people don't know what it's like some of the modern hacks that you talk about to me are, are very um self-evident like no tv at night no caffeine after two one of the ones that i really liked and hit home is no bills or stress in the bedroom that's great that's a tough one but people do it i mean you know my wife used to do it and i like you know we got into this big thing i'm like do not bring that into the bedroom like the last thing you want to be thinking about before trying to shut down is your bills and your you know life's you know trials and tribulations you know going into sleep like you want to take your you know kind of soft and gentle and happy thoughts into into sleep and then you know so it's like you know, I, I remember very specifically, my wife used to watch like CSI and all this kind of crap. Mm -hmm. And, yep. um, you know, she liked it. She likes detective shows. That's fine. But she would watch them at night and then come to bed and then wake up like jolting and screaming and be like, I had a nightmare that someone came in the house and was trying to kill you. <laughs> like, you don't say. Right. And so, like, you know, we made a bet and I said, look, stop watching that crap and let's see. And then, you know, a month or two later, she, she was like, hey, you know what? You're totally right.
I haven't had any of those nightmares. I'm like, well, of course the mind just, the mind is like a sponge. It just picks up these images and then replays them. The brain doesn't know the difference between reality and that perceived reality on TV. So the reality, if you, if you are what you eat, the reality that you've now like onboarded is this crazy, murderous, sociopathic nightmare of a reality that you have now embedded in the fertile soil of your mind and welcome to your dreams. Oops. Truly, truly. Um, in Chapter 5, you talk about a stagnant lifestyle. Let me just run these numbers. The average commute is one hour. We spend about eight hours a day at the office. But the biggest one that just bowled me over was 19.6 hours a week of TV and, and social media. Yep. That is just outstanding and not in a good way well i mean people are always complaining about not having time well there it is folks <laughs> you know what i mean take it back like you want to take your time your energy and your money and invest in a better healthier brighter future for yourself your family and your planet look at where you're leaking i mean look if i was like a a budget like get you out of debt guy what would we look at the first place is your expenses right and be like, oh, looks like you're spending, you know, four four hundred fifty dollars a month on, you know, eating out. Why don't we pack lunches, right? So it's the same thing we would look at in terms of time. Is just start tracking where your time is going, because most people are complaining about not having it. Well, we all have the same amount. So the question is, where are you spending yours, right? And how can you get better? Like my whole thing with the Urban Monk is, you're not going to get more hours out of the day. So where do we swap in healthy? Uh, healthy practices throughout your day to swap out, you know, on, on things that you that don't serve you, like sitting around, you know, watching TV or thinking you're decompressing on the sofa. Like that's that's insane. That's not decompression. It's basically adding to, you know, insult to injury. A hundred percent true. Um, in Chapter six, we talk about weight gain and negative self-image. And I think this this is a big one and and this is where part of the, i would say the crux of the problem is for us in the u.s yeah so talk to me a little bit about some of the um let me get to that cut that i missed what i wanted to say that's okay uh cut that okay so the urban monk wisdom in chapter six you talk about who is burning fat in the first place and who are you anyhow so could you talk about that a little bit yeah to me this is a really big one i used to you know back in my la clinics i used to have a lot of fashion models coming in and mm -hmm. it was amazing to see these beautiful beautiful girls be so just destroyed and just just demoralized and beat up about how fat and ugly they looked and it's just like what what are you talking about? What is what is going on in your head, right? And so, you know, I, I started to really peel back and realize that, you know, it's just they've had people telling them they're fat their whole lives. And they've had all this stuff that has to do with other people's approval of you tied to the value of their self-image. And so, you know, Epictetus, which is one of my, you know, favorite kind of old Greek philosophers said, if you ever worry about if you base your happiness on things that other people have to give you, like fame and, and, and glory and all these types of things, you're never going to be happy. Right. Pure and simple. So the question is, before talking about diet and like, oh, my God, you know, did this sugar detox or this other so and so diet and everyone's talking about all this crap question is why who are you and what drives you and what makes you happy and what does any of this matter anyways and i'm not saying just sit around and eat like you know doritos i'm seeing i'm saying ask those bigger questions find out where your true happiness comes from and then life starts to spark and you end up you know being more active for the right reasons and then when you're not fixated on how you look all the time you end up looking better anyways because you're you're filled with life and vitality a hundred percent true. The one thing that you wrote that I really, uh, really spoke to me was eat like a monk. Um, explain that a little bit. You know, we would spend a lot of time around meals 
um, basically, you know, we would sit there and be reverent and look at the food and, and chew it slowly and be like, hey, where did this come from? And, and you know, th this plant, this vegetable, this, this animal, um, you know, it laid itself on the sacrificial altar of life for me. And so what am I doing with my life to, to kind of pay it forward? And so, you know, there was this whole element of slow reverence and chewing and connecting with the food that's going to be you and the life that's coming in to become your life. And that's that, that's an element that's just been, you know, just tragically taken out of the equation where it's just like, throw me a power bar while, you know, so I can hit it on the drive while I take the call, um, you know, on my way to the next meeting, you know, that's become food. And it's just it's, yes. it's a completely disconnected way of engaging in life and engaging with food. And you wonder why everyone's stressed about weight and self-image and, you know, how they interface with food and have problems with food. It's because the, the, the good stuff is all gone. There's just really no good energy around it other than, you know, stress and is this bad for me or, oh, my God, that might have gluten. And, and food has become just another stressor in life instead of this wonderful place where we have community and we come together and celebrate and have reverence for. So I think that that's a, a really big piece of the equation that's been missing. And, and you know, a lot of the, uh, the impetus, I mean, I got enough stuff going on, a lot of the impetus for me to write this book was to really carry that conversation out into the mainstream and be like, look, people, what are we doing, right? Like, let's let's bring it back a little bit. This is, this is way, way more important than, than, you know, the conversation about how many calories of sugar you had. Yes. One of the things that we practice at home is, as, as you know, as a physician, you're out of the house uh, I'm four days a week. I'm in my office. The other three days, it is a priority for us to sit down as a family and have dinner together and be mindful, like you said, uh, mindful eating. But also, you know, what was Jack, what was great in your day? Emma, what was your challenges in your day? And it's really important for that sense of family. That's what mindful eating to me 100%, means. 100%. Sitting around the table, giving thanks, whatever religious tradition you come from, you yep. know, and, and, and really just coming together with your loved ones and giving thanks for the food and the company and, and really making it uh, a ritual. And, and to that point, I want to add something. You can sure. be sitting there with Jack and Emma and whoever else and you get your little like kumbaya dinner going on. And if you have your phone or if someone else has their phone at that table, mm -hmm. consider it an open invitation for the entire known universe, including ISIS and Donald Trump and anyone else who's squawking right now, to interrupt your family time and your meal with some BS. A hundred percent. That's why phones are not allowed at the Bingo. table. Good. <laughs> Absolutely. Get the phones the hell out of that room because Absolutely. you know what? Even if it's within eyes, this like if you can even see it, it brings up anxiety. Yes. Get it? That out is so the, true. Get it out of the room. This is family time. It's you guys together enjoying your time together, and that's rare and that's valuable. And the only way you assign value to things is to dedicate and allocate time um, and, and, and really be there with those people. Absolutely. Um, in Chapter 7, there you write, no connection with nature or things that are real. And the one the one thing that you said really struck home when you're talking about the microbiome, what you said was, I believe, uh, there is more, quote, unquote, not us, than quote unquote us in what we refer to as our bodies. Crazy, right? It's true. <laughs> yeah, there is so much life living in our guts. There is so much life living with on our skin. There's so much bacterial life that is supportive of who we are and how we express genetically that it is to the hundreds of billions of organisms and in, in that, it outnumbers the cells of our body. And so quite literally, what we consider us, like, you know, just touch yourself, like pat your body. All around you, there's a cloud of bacteria that are supportive of the environment that you live in. On your skin, 
in your mouth all the way through your your GI tract is like pounds of the stuff, right? And and yep. all the way through every single bit of your being, there are friendly bacteria that are supportive. And even inside your cell, there's mitochondria that are, you know, kind of a symbiotic bacteria that help us make energy and, and, and you know, run the whole show. So just our entire perception of self is being shifted by this scientific understanding. And it really does kind of um, pay homage to the old kind of mystical things of how like we're all one and all life is connected. And you start looking at this on a cellular level, you're like, holy crap, we really are. Like I walk by you and the bacterial cloud around me exchanges with your bacterial cloud. And we have this weird microbial interaction that you and I don't even perceive or we don't even touch, but like stuff is happening with this kind of like life intermediary that's, you know, all around us. It's actually kind of sad that the uh, general public has bought into this uh, antimicrobial wipes. And it's 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 sad to think that we've been brainwashed. Yeah. And look, I mean, there's good bugs and bad bugs. But, you know, the problem yep. is the baby's been thrown out with the bathwater. And, and we and we know this now, right? Like, you know, sterile, even hospitals are lining good bacteria on, you know, their floors and everything to crowd yes. out the bad ones. And so, you know, we came from this, um, how shall I say, this kind of golden era of allopathic medicine where, you know, the antibiotics, the steroids and the surgery were like outperforming uh, some other things. And, you know, we, we didn't stop to look back in the t last 20 years to realize that we had gone way overboard. And sterilizing everything has actually created this other crisis where we're choking out the supportive life in the organisms that are there to coexist and help us. The um, I just want to skip over to Chapter 8. What you said is absolutely spot on. And in Chapter 8, we, we talk about lonely despite being surrounded by people. And the two things that you wrote were just brilliant. The first one under Urban Monk Wisdom is have a life of service. And then the other thing that I thought was so important for people to hear is find spirituality if religion has failed you. Could you talk about those a little bit? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really tough. Like, you know, people grow up with some sort of anchor in uh, some moral, ethical tradition that was very useful and was the fabric of, of our society, right? And then some nasty priest, you know, molested some kid in the church or some, you know, some church went like too money hungry or if you're Muslim, all of a sudden, they, you know, there's radicalized people and you kind of disavowed that. If you're Jewish, it, you know, they were too Jewish and you went kind of towards more like reformed and now you just, you know, show up on holidays. And, you know, we all have different kind of backgrounds and where we came from. Uh, and a lot of people feel like religion has has you know been a thing of the past, but the 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 baby in that bathwater is really there's this whole mor moral code and kind of ethical backbone that has been very useful, and you know I think that needs to kind of roll forward into a personal spirituality. Like I'm not I'm not a big organized religion guy. I think it's just makes right. it messy. I think it just really like. You know, it really brings too many middlemen between you and your, you know, your version of God, whatever that is, right? And so find that connection and find it now. Just because some people messed it up for religion doesn't mean that, you know, God is to blame. So go find God however you need to do that. And make that your personal um, your personal practice, and it doesn't have to be like belonging to a church or giving money here or there and all the kind of weird human political stuff that got kind of layered onto it. Just go find that deeper personal connection because, yeah, man, everyone's just everyone's just lonely and confused and looking for answers and a lot of times the churches don't have the answers they they're they're very judgmental they're very quick to you know feed you uh you know belief systems that that are not necessarily tied to what the book says but what you know their agenda is and and smart people are just off of that right and so then where do yes. smart people go uh, absolutely they find spiritualities where they yeah, go hopefully hopefully because <laughs> hopefully because yeah, a lot of them you know have fallen into watching the kardashians and, and and just you know thinking that you know the whole thing is the whole thing is up in flames and and you know, we'd right. like to bring them back you know a hundred percent true 
So chapter nine, never enough money. The things that the urban monk wisdom says is money is a medium of exchange. We need food and shelter. We want steak and mansions. I love that. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Talk about um, a couple of the or one or two of the Eastern practices to bring that in line. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I did uh, for my last movie, Origins, was – you know, part of the experience was we went and learned how to like track and survive uh, amongst the big five in Africa. You know, lions and and elephants and buffalo and rhino and you know all the big the big dangerous guys, right? And you know the principle out there was you know just learn what their behavior, learn what they do, kind of don't get in their way and and get yours. And one of mm -hmm. the, my teachers in the movie, who's great, and this is, you know, we did this training stateside, was a guy named Cliff Hodges, who basically said, look, you know, you have, you have your needs and your wants in life. Your needs are food, water, shelter, fire, right? Everything else is a want. Yep. And so when you put yourself in a situation where you get into, like, survival training and you learn about how to take care of those needs and how to kind of set yourself up to, you know, survive, everything else is a luxury, and most of us are stressing about luxuries and our money is going towards things that aren't necessarily necessary to keep us alive. But we think they're necessary because, you know, you know, Johnny and Katie down the street got a BMW and we don't want to look like losers on the block, you know. And so like all this weird stuff that, that pulls us into the stress that then kills us and leaves our children without parents. That's the unnecessary BS that I'm taking a stand for and being like, look, your life force is tied to your time and your energy on this planet, and you're exchanging that for this currency called money, and then you're mm -hmm. squandering that on stuff that doesn't serve you in the long run. So let's take a look at that. So that chapter is really kind of – it goes for it. Absolutely. So in, in the last chapter, we talk about living a life with purpose. And I got to tell you, the modern hacks really spoke to me because it's stuff that I do. Daily journaling. The other one I really like is dream journaling. Could you talk about those two? Yeah, I think it's, it's really hard because we always – uh, prioritize others versus self, right? So it's like when someone mm -hmm. tells me, hey, you know, my, my goal is to like get fit and, you know, really like have a six pack this year. I'm like, okay, let me see your phone. Let me see your calendar. And yeah, I don't see the gym anywhere in this. So where did you book it in, right? So we, we mm -hmm. tend to forget to schedule self care in. And one of those really powerful self care practices is journaling, where we just, I, we, give ourselves a chance to kind of dump and unload what's going on, what's frustrating us and where we want to go. And it helps us mirror our psyche and have an, have like this kind of healthy conversation with ourselves so that we can kind of recalibrate and focus. And some of those answers are really profound when they come through in dreams. Cause that's when we're kind of working out and problem solving in kind of that unconscious space. And so mm -hmm. having a dream journal by the side of your bed and just building a habit of like first thing you do, it has to be the first thing you do. If not, it's gone. First thing you do when you wake up is get up and just write down and record everything you remember from your dreams and just start doing it and then go back once a week, go back once a day, whenever you can and just review it. You will start to find magic, just thematic, just, just the juiciest stuff that is super helpful in helping you kind of like un- tangle yourself from the web of crap that you've kind of built in your life and it'll help guide you towards your stated goals dreams aspirations or help you realign those to where your heart is really supposed to be so i, I gotta say it's a really powerful practice don't take it lightly once you start doing it you'll know what i'm talking about and obviously you know um you know because you do it and uh you know it's it's just you know a lot of people are like oh that sounds kind of hippy dippy and um I got to say, a lot of the best psychologists I know use this as a tool with their patients, and it works profoundly well.
I've, I've got to thank my wife, Denise, for that, because she's the one who's down here, you know, at 5.30 a.m. journaling, and she likes to handwrite, and I come down and do it on an app on my phone, but it's it's brilliant. It's, it's pure genius, and there's a connection that happens that you start in motion all of this stuff. I write what I'm grateful for, what would make today great. Um, that's the five minute, uh, the five minute journal, I believe it's called, that I use. Fantastic. Yeah, and and, and it's yeah. changed your life. I mean, it has. It's changed yeah, my life. It's profound Absolutely. Profound stuff, and I can't, you know, I'll leave it at that. You know what I mean? Like it is really, really, really good. Well, Pedram, you have written an amazing book, and folks, I've only covered about 5% in this 40 minutes that we've been on the phone. This is outstanding stuff. I really encourage you to go out and purchase this book. Pedram, where can people find you and find the book on the web? Uh, so I'm easy to find theurbanmonk.com. Um, and then my other universe is well.org. You could find, um, you know, a short link is uh, well.org slash uh, um for the urban monk uh, it goes straight to the book but um and then you'll, we'll, we'll get you some links for for you to share with your audience as well um, make yep. it easy uh but yeah the urban monk.com and well.org are you know my universes and um i have a really good time hanging out there awesome and folks we will get that out to you so that you can obviously click on that link and purchase the book well everybody I am Dr. Mike Agenfora with Pedram Sojai, and I want to thank you so much for being on the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast, Pedram. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Fantastic. Thank you.